Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, pig slopping, in 46. Oh, every Christmas we visit my Uncle Fred in prison. Hello, genies. It is Fisher, and welcome to a classic rewind of Extreme Genes. Of course, as you know, we just completed Roots Tech this past week in Salt Lake City, Utah, an amazing conference. And coming up here next week, David Allen Lambert and I will be back talking about some of the amazing experiences, some of the incredible connections that were made during that event. Hope you enjoy this classic rewind from 2016. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment is brought to you by our friends at LegacyTree.com. And uh, very excited today to delve into a question I have dealing with a scoundrel ancestor, and maybe it's going to affect you too. Yeah, I've got an ancestor who appears to have perhaps set up his wife for a divorce in 1874 with false testimony. What is that about? How do I know or why do I suspect it? We'll tell you a little more about that later. And my guest, the legal genealogist, Judy Russell, is going to take her shot at that and talk to us about divorce in the 19th century around the country. A very difficult issue back in those times, but there's a lot more to it than I think any of us really knew. So I'm looking forward to talking to Judy about this. By the way, don't forget this week to sign up for our Extreme Genes newsletter. It's our weekly newsletter. It's called The Weekly Genie. And I'm going to talk a little in there about dealing with your scoundrel ancestors. What do you record about them? What don't you? What rules do you follow? I've got a few ideas on it. You might as well. So check that out. You can sign up now at ExtremeGenes.com. Let's head out now to Boston for my good friend, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. It is David Allen Lambert. How are you, sir? Oh, everything is wonderful here in Beantown. How are things with you, Fish? You know, going well and excited to be going into the indoor time of year. I think we get a lot more research done now that we don't have all the yard work to do. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully you did all the field work in the cemeteries, and that leads me to our first story for this week in Family History News. The Calvert family were the leading family in Colonial Maryland, and a few years back, they actually found lead coffins, three of them, with members of the family. In one of the coffins were the remains of an infant boy. Now, they've been able to use DNA to discover that he's actually the son of Philip Calvert, who is a colonial governor of Maryland. So DNA has uncovered a CSI, if you will, from a cemetery from over 300 years ago. Isn't that amazing? And you think about it, there are ways to get DNA other than spitting in a cup. That's true. And hats off to 62-year-old Lena Alvarez in Madrid, Spain. Ten years ago, when she was in her early 50s, she had a child, and this boy is doing quite well. But at the age of 62, she has recently become a mother of a baby girl. Oh, wow. And this is her third kid, actually. The oldest is like 28 years old. I'm thinking we nominate her right now to become PTA president when this little girl's a senior in high school. That year, Lena will be 80 years old. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I hope that she lives to see her children, grandchildren. Well, maybe not great-grandchildren, but hey, (laughs) anything's possible. Exactly. As we approach 2017, it will be the 100th anniversary of America's entrance into World War I. The Brits were already in the thick of things, and over in the trenches in France, many lost their lives, including two men, Privates William Marman and Harry Carter, both in their early 20s, who were part of the 10th Battalion Essex Regiment. At one of the bombings, their remains were lost, and they thought that they were buried in a grave by the Commonwealth War Graves. It turns out they were recently found. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Some archaeological work discovered the two men still with their kits in their uniforms, holding their rifles, and it's amazing. So now descendants of the two men are going to be part of the funeral where they're going to be reburied. I think it's wonderful. And the surprising fact of this fish, over in France, an average of 40 World War I veterans are found each year. That's incredible, isn't it? And to think they're bringing them home. Do we find that for Civil War vets around the country? I, I got to imagine once in a while. They still come up once in a while. And when I was a reenactor over 20 years ago, we buried the remains of a Civil War veteran in Massachusetts 
that had been sent back to Massachusetts were lost or put in a warehouse in a box. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And yeah, so the government can neglect things occasionally. In local news in Brockton, Massachusetts, a neighboring town to where I live, a recent car break in actually did not have a car stereo stolen. It did not have a pocketbook stolen. It had their mother stolen. What? How's that work? Well, in the glove compartment was a container with the ashes of the owner of the vehicle's mother. Ooh. So the thought is that they're hoping that the person doesn't think they're drugs and snorts the oh, remains. Oh, and the ingests the person. remains. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's terrible. Wow. So I haven't heard any follow-up, so hopefully <laughs> someone returns the remains. And rule of thumb, don't carry mom and dad around in the dashboard. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure they, they were doing that because they were looking to scatter the ashes in familiar areas mm-hmm. around Brockton, right? Exactly, exactly. Really is sad. You know, we talked about cemeteries earlier with the burial of the World War One veterans, and I guess my genealogy tip of the week would be a proximity photograph. If you're going to put a photo online of a gravestone, sure, be close. Take great detail photographs so you can read it. But take another photograph and take the proximity. Maybe there's a larger monument nearby, a wall, a building. Yeah, something that helps you identify the location of that marker, right? Exactly. Well, every week, NEHGS brings our listeners a free guest member database. And this week, we're sponsoring New England resources for free. So that will include Tory's New England marriages to the 1700s, as well as the information from the Great Migration Study Project. Hope that you check out AmericanAncestors.org and become a guest member. Well, that's all I have for this week, Fish. I'll talk to you soon. All right, David. Take care. We'll talk to you again next week. And coming up next, we're going to talk to the legal genealogist, Judy Russell. Judy is going to help us understand a little about divorce in the 19th century, a whole different game than it is in the 21st century. And we're going to talk about the possibility that my great-grandfather had fake testimony given so he could divorce his first wife. We'll get Judy's take on that coming up for you in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. 
Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Jeans, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Jeans Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Jeans Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Jeans rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on extremejeans.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well known family history experts. Catch visits with Genie stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert CeCe Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. Welcome back to America's Family History Show. It's Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is being brought to you by MyHeritage.com. Recently, I was working on some information about my great-grandfather and discovered he was the first person in our family to ever get a divorce. And we're talking 1874, way back in New York City, and I was actually able to obtain the documents relating to that experience and that event. And I must admit, the papers that were in there were rather salacious. Sometime later, as, as uh, great-grandfather went through his life, he died in the arms of his lover in upstate New York. But the person who filled out the death certificate for him at that time, provided the, the name of his parents and his age and, and his occupation, was the same man who had confessed 19 years earlier to having been with Andrew's wife, the very one he wound up divorcing. So there was obviously a very friendly relationship between these people. What was going on? And that's why I wanted to bring my good friend Judy Russell, the legal genealogist, back on the show and talk about divorce in the 19th century, a little bit different than it is today, because, Judy, that whole thing sounded like a setup to me. It absolutely sounds like a setup, Scott. And the fact of the matter is... There was an entire industry created in New York for the purpose of securing divorces. The reason? The law. Mm -hmm. New York was very restrictive in the grounds for getting a divorce. Now, you know, you think about the English system and, and whether you could get a divorce early on. It generally was for adultery only. Right. And adultery by the wife. Yes. The husband could cat around, the, the, the woman could not. Now, when we came over to the colonies, we changed things a little because we had something the English didn't have. We had running room. Right, right. So <laughs> desertion became okay. an accepted grounds for divorce in most of early America, but not New York. That's New interesting. New York really restricted it to, to adultery. And with it being so restricted, if you didn't have the proof of adultery, what did you do? You didn't want to just stick with a marriage, so you manufactured the evidence. And so you got a friend together and said, look, these records are going to be sealed for 100 years. Nobody's ever going to know. You're not going to be prosecuted for adultery. So help me out. I'm not sure that they had been assured that they'd be sealed for 100 years. The sealing is more of a modern thing. But the reality was everybody knew what was going on. Right. This was probably a single man at the time who right. provided the evidence. Yes. So what's the downside to him? There was a congressional investigation into this entire industry of New York in manufacturing the evidence for, for divorces. No kidding. And how far back did the manufacturing go? I'm sure it went back Practically to the point where the English took over after the Dutch left New wow. Netherland, wow. which, by the way, was a very different legal system and much more favorable to divorce. Yes. There were actual grants of dissolution of marriage under the Dutch. And then the English come in and change everything around and make it so much harder. Much, much more difficult. <laughs> now, throughout the rest of the country, how about the South? How was d divorce in the 19th century in the South? 
very difficult to get divorces throughout the South. I mean, you have places like Maryland where you didn't even have a divorce law on the books until 1841. In Virginia, you needed an act of the legislature until 1851. Wow. In Georgia, you had to get a court conclusion that you were entitled to a divorce and then go to the legislature and get a two-thirds vote. That's, now, wait a minute. The legislature got to vote the on legislat- individual divorces? Individual divorces. Wow. And if you think that's bad, in South Carolina, there was never a single legal divorce until the 1950s. The, Not The one. 1950s. 1950s. Wow. This it was, blows it my was mind. unconstitutional sure. to get a divorce in, in South Carolina. So it's always been a commitment to keeping families together. So what did people do? They had to move somewhere, but it doesn't sound like there was anywhere really to go. Two options. Okay. One very common option was that they simply abandoned one family, took off, changed jurisdictions, went across the state line, sometimes just the county line, set up a new family, and went on their way. Bigamy was not really an unusual event, particularly if you're coming out of a jurisdiction where divorce was impossible or hard to get. You simply didn't bother. So is bigamy by definition a common law marriage where you just move in with somebody, it starts as adultery, and then over time it becomes common law? Sure. Really? Sure. And that would be considered a bigamous situation. It, it, it absolutely would, under the law, be considered a bigamous situation once it had reached the point of maybe rising to it. Although you would never get to a recognition of the second relationship as a common law marriage because one of the requirements for a common law marriage is that you be free to marry. Right, right, right. So it's that you're never going to really get to that. So that's one possibility, and sure. we all have to look at that. It's not at all unusual for there to be a marriage without being free to marry. All right. Number two. Number two is the divorce mecca, meaning a place where the laws made it easier to get a divorce. Did both people have to go there, establish residency like they do with, say, Reno today or anything that's, like that? That's the reason why they were really meccas. We think about Reno, we think about Nevada, we say, oh, well, that's the divorce mecca. In the 1850s, it was Indiana. Really? And the reason why people went to Indiana was, number one, no, you didn't have to both go, only the one who wanted the divorce, and he had to stay there for like a month. Okay, wait a minute. You just said he had to go. A woman couldn't do this? She could, But it wasn't as easy for her. She was usually the one who had the care of the children. She was usually the one who didn't want the divorce. It was much harder then and now for a woman to support herself outside of the marital relationship. What was so different about Indiana? What made their attitude such that they had such looser laws? What was different about maybe their religious situation? I don't think it was religion as much as it was that it was, at the time, still pretty much the frontier. Yep, So it was. So you, you have a, a situation where the law simply favored letting people have a fresh start to clear the decks and clear the books. And once the law started, it became an industry. Okay. There would be the hotels who would be able to put you up and, and you would get your little part-time job. And, and the advertising, you, and you did that, by the way, in the Indiana newspapers. Right. Who's going to see that? Exactly. But the Indiana newspapers loved it. They got all the legal advertising. So what era are we talking about here? What years? 1850s, 1860s. Big push in Indiana for this very liberal set of laws on divorce. So I'm assuming a lot of these guys already had the next one lined up. So they're out there, perhaps already with her, getting the divorce, then getting married. And then what do they do? Inform the person back east? Absolutely. That, oh, okay, and by the take, way, you've been divorced. Here's my, here's my certificate. And you then go back to New Jersey or New York or whatever certificate in hand. Wow. And just present it to the person and say, that's it. That's we're done. It. We're done. I've had it. 
and there's no taking care of that person financially? Or how did that work, other than just the, the goodwill of the husband? Essentially, remember, we're still talking fault divorces. Sure. So when he goes there to get his divorce, he's going to be claiming that she deserted him, that she abandoned him, that she was catting around. So it's a fault divorce. And in a fault divorce, everything was done for the benefit of the the person who was the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, your guy was in New York. Right. You do realize that New York law limited the right to remarry. Yes. (laughs) To the, quote, Innocent, end quote, spouse. The quote from the judge in the divorce case in the file that I got said that uh, my great grandfather, Andrew, was free to marry as if he had never been previously married, whereas his previous wife, Amanda, was not free to marry until Andrew was dead. Or under the law, New York did eventually relent a little. And if Andrew had remarried, then she could have, yes. Then the ex-wife would have been entitled once some time had passed and she'd kind of repented yes. of her misdeeds. <laughs> so this was Man. this was an amazing situation. Yeah. And and here again, you know, you start with Indiana and then the reformers come in and the churches step in and they say, wait a minute, we don't want this reputation. So Indiana changed its laws. And you had to live there for a year. Wow. So a lot of people probably just stayed, didn't they, at that point? Nope. No, they moved on to a new place. New divorce (laughs) mecca. You want to take a guess? No idea. Fill me in. The Territory of Utah. The Territory of Utah. In the Territory of Utah, you not only didn't have to actually be a resident, You only had to file an affidavit saying you wanted to become a resident. And with that, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back in five minutes and talk more about divorce in the 19th century with my good friend Judy Russell, the legal genealogist on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, 
And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show on ExtremeGenes.com. It's Fisher here talking to Judy Russell. She is the legal genealogist. And we've been delving into this whole concept of divorce in the 19th century, which is about all it was at the time, was a concept very difficult to get. And, and we were talking about these bastions of places where people could actually go, Judy, to escape the East and the South. And you had talked about Indiana, and now you're talking about the territory of Utah. Their rules were that you didn't even have to live there. You just had to show an intent to live there? Exactly. You literally could establish your right to get into the courts there in the territory of Utah if you signed an affidavit saying you wanted to become a resident of the territory of Utah. That's incredible. So again, it's it's very much this frontier mentality and the whole notion of people being given the opportunity to have a fresh start and a new start. You know, if the other side is only getting, quote, notified, end quote, by a newspaper notice that's published in Salt Lake City and they're in South Carolina, Nobody is going to show up from the other side and contest it. Ever. (laughs) So you have these uncontested divorces that are basically clearing the decks legally for somebody to start a new life. Now, did this uh, go on just through the territory years? Did that continue through statehood? No, it certainly didn't continue through statehood as the Mormon church worked very diligently to acquire the credibility with the Congress to to get statehood right. recognized, it wasn't going to fight on two fronts. It right. was already fighting the issue of the polygamy question and right. how that was going to be dealt with legally. So it fundamentally started closing it down. You had to be a resident. And as with everything else, when things get tougher in one location, it's going to open up somewhere else. So where did they go after Utah? The somewhere else was another territory at the time, and it was the Dakota Territory. Okay, boy, you talk about the middle of nowhere in the 19th century. (laughs) Except that the railroads were coming through. Of course. So it was not all that hard to take your railroad car and get yourself to Bismarck, North Dakota, or Pierre, South Dakota, and find yourself in a position to get the divorce that you wanted. Establish residency? Did you have to? But again, a very limited establishment. Sure. If it's if you have to be there for a month or six weeks or six months. Right. It was so much better than not being able to get the divorce at all in the East. The South Dakota continued until about 1909. So that was a possibility. So is this something where people, if they're looking for where a divorce took place, they might want to go to these places? And how available are those records in these various states? Most states' divorce records, if they are sealed at all, they're only sealed for like 50 years. Mm -hmm. So most of these records are widely available. They're all court filings. Sure. So for the most part, these are perfectly accessible records. If you can find the indexes for them, and I would assume not a lot of them are online yet. Not a lot of the court records are online yet, although more and more and more are coming online. And of course, we're we're all exceedingly grateful to Family Search for its concentrated effort to get court records of all kinds off of the microfilm and onto the digital side, even if it doesn't have an index. I want to take you through a couple of more options. Okay. And then we'll talk about how do you find the record if you're not sure that there might be one. Okay. Oklahoma. Yes. And I'm talking now about Indian Territory yes. and the Oklahoma Territory. So late 1890s, good place to go. And then, of course, we all know Nevada was right. the next one. 20th century divorces, very big in Nevada. There's one more divorce mecca that a lot of people don't think about, but it was bigger than Nevada in the 1950s and 1960s. Really? And where would that be? That was Alabama. Alabama. There were three times as many divorces granted in Alabama in the 1960s as in Nevada. No kidding. So it was the divorce mecca of the 20th century. Sure. So you've got a person who was married in New Jersey in 1850, and there's no divorce you can find in the East, but now they're married to somebody else in the 1870s. Yeah, what happened? Where do you go and how do you find those records? 
one of the best things to do is look in the newspaper legal advertising columns. Now, we all think to look in the news columns, but legal advertising, where people had to put notices into the newspapers, are about the best source of genealogical information that you can think of. So Chronicling America, uh, Newspapers.com, Genealogy Genealogy Bank, Bank, right? Old Fulton postcards in New York. Fantastic. This is a guy who has digitized more newspapers than the Library of Congress, and he's done it all by himself. Yes, yes. And now beyond New York newspapers, he's branching out to other states. Incredible. Places like the Portal of Texas History or Digital Missouri. The Library of Virginia. Each state seems to have its own place. And so you want to identify the meccas, which again are Indiana, Utah, the Dakotas, Oklahoma, Nevada, Alabama. If you don't find a divorce that you expect to find, where you expect to find them, you want to go through the meccas and see if you can find it there. And hopefully they've got the newspaper accounts there that are available online. Exactly. And then, well, you probably just have to go to the courts at that point and try to order it by the date and the name. That's it. Okay. So it, it's not rocket science. No. But it's the painstaking following every clue and thinking about that mantra that I keep saying. If you want to understand the records, if you want to find the records, you have to understand the law at the time and the place. That's why she's the legal genealogist. When did New York finally loosen up? (laughs) Going back all the way to our first segment here, Judy, when did they finally put an end to this thing where adultery with often fake witnesses is the only way to get a divorce? When did that finally end? In the 1970s. The 1970s. Fundamentally, there was an entire movement across the country to move to no-fault divorces. That we were tired of, of people lying to try to put fault that only created acrimony and, and bitterness and, and really hurt the children. The notion was, if grown people can't get along, let's get them out of here and clear the decks. So the no-fault divorce movement really started towards the end of the 1960s and spread throughout the country. Pretty much everywhere now, it's it's no pretty, fault. Pretty close. There are still an awful lot of divorces that are granted on fault grounds. But no-fault divorce is essentially available throughout the United States. And Reno today? Even today. But it may be faster to get a divorce in one jurisdiction than another. Ah, For example, in my home state of New Jersey, in order to get a no-fault divorce, you have to have lived separate and apart for 18 months. And if you're anxious (laughs) to take care of your young friend, as your great-grandfather was, you might want to move that process along a little. Yes, with a little help from his friend. Exactly. Who stayed his friend for many years thereafter. Incredible. Thank you so much, Judy. What a joy to have you back on the show. And uh, my head is swimming with all the possibilities of, of where to research and what you will find out, especially when I consider the documents I found in my great grandfather's divorce file. Wow. Great stuff. She's the legal genealogist. Go to legalgenealogist.com to find out a lot more about Judy Russell. Thank you, Scott. This segment has been brought to you by rootsmagic.com. And coming up next, we'll talk preservation with Tom Perry, our preservation authority. We've got a listener email about her hundreds of cassettes that she wants to digitize. That's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. That is Tom Perry over there. He is our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. Welcome back, Tom. Great to be here. Got an email from Mary Lee, and she doesn't tell us where she's from. You know, when you email us, you got to tell us where you're from. We want to know. She says, I have a 100-plus cassette tape collection, recorded voice, not music, that I'd like to digitize, probably using Audacity, unless you recommend something else. I have a Hitachi dual cassette deck and an amplifier that are in good condition. The cassette deck has standard female right and left input and output jack ports in the back. I didn't try to take it apart to photograph the back. Photographing is, by the way, very good if you're writing to Tom. Show him what you're talking about. She says, will I be able to get a decent digital file using the cassette deck and a computer? Tom. These are really good questions because we have a lot of people that uh, write in or call our store and say, hey, you know, I got audio questions. So this, this one's great. She covers so many different things. Let's kind of take it, you know, piece by piece. Make sure you write me at asktom at tmcplace.com, and we'll get back to you and, you know, possibly read your questions on the air. All right, the first thing is you have a lot of cassettes. When, yes. you, have, <laughs> when you have that many, she says she has 100 plus. Right. This is the time that I say this is a DIY project because you can buy equipment as expensive as it is, but it's still going to save you money when you have this many. So if you have the time or you have one of your kids that can help you do these things, because they're, they're not hard to do. It's just time consuming. Right. So if you're able to allocate the time to do this, this is a smart thing to do. Tom, is this something that she would do at real time speed? You wouldn't do it fast, right? I really hate that. A lot of people do that. But I tell people, you know, pretty much you're going to get what you pay for. If you're going to somebody that's going to charge you 10 bucks to do a 60-minute cassette, they're not doing it in real time, or they're not going to be able to keep their store open, or they're doing it in their basement, you know, or having their, they've taught their Pomeranians how to transfer tapes or something. And we'll talk about prices, and I'll give you estimates of what most people should be charging, 
But we run into people that send us, hey, this sounds like it's too good to be true. There's this guy in southern Florida that transfers film for five cents a foot. Could that be legit? Run the numbers. There's no way somebody could do it for that. So you want to be fair. You want to do what you can do. And if you're really tight on budget, sometimes it's better than nothing. However, if you're going to go really, really inexpensive, make sure you do it with somebody local. Don't take the chance of shipping something across the country to somebody that has these too good to be true prices because they might be gone tomorrow and you may never have your stuff back again. That's the one case that I would say it's not good to take the chance of digitizing your things. So you want to do this yourself. Exactly. When she's got 100, that's definitely a good way to do it. And she mentioned Audacity, which is a great program. It's a good inexpensive program. However, as many as you have, this is another thing where I say invest a little bit more money and get Pro Tools because Pro Tools is going to give you a lot of options. And this comes back to your question, Fish, about doing a high speed. There are a lot of people that do a high speed. If all you want to do is get it done and get it transcribed, you don't really care about anything else. High speed's a great way to do it because you can do it at 10 times a normal speed, and then you go into Pro Tools and have that change it. And if all you're going to be is transcribing it, who cares if, you know, Aunt Martha's voice is a little bit high or, you know, Uncle Jesse's voice is a little bit low. It doesn't matter because all you're going to be doing is transcribing it. And that's a fine time to do a high speed. But video... I would never do high speed because you're going to run into all kinds of problems. With Pro Tools, I love it because it has a lot of options. You can clean up your audio. You can make it sound so much better. A lot of times you're going to have noise in the background that you can't understand, and that's really going to help you a lot. After the break, we'll talk a little bit about you know what you want on the front end as far as your cassette player that's going to transfer your thing to your MP3s or your AIFs or whatever you want to do. All right. This segment has been brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And I know Tom's got a lot more on this in his head. We'll get to in just about three minutes. By the way, if you have a question for Tom, remember that email address. It's asktom at tmcplace.com. Back in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. And we are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. This segment brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And we're talking to Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He's our preservation authority. Talking about this great email from a listener named Mary Lee. 
asking about these cassette tapes she has, old audio recorded voice cassette tapes. And uh, she wants to work with an Itachi dual cassette deck, and she wants to digitize, wants to do it herself, Tom. And that's incredible, and that's great, and it's going to save her a lot of money, but it's going to take a lot of time. It will. And like I say, I love it when people want to do it themselves. It's a great opportunity. You get more into it, and you can do a lot of fancier things because when you hire us or somebody else that's out there, you're going to have to pay somebody else to do it. Where when you do it yourself, you can spend a little extra 10 minutes here or 30 minutes here and make it that much better where when you're paying somebody to do it for you, it's harder because, oh, that 10% more is going to cost me you know, 25% more in cost. It's not worth it. So do it yourself as much as you can. And audio isn't as critical as video. Audio is kind of hard to screw up on. You can go in and do things like we've talked on previous shows. Even though you're doing audio, you can actually physically see the waveform. So when you're editing, you're not just sitting there like in our old days when we use tape and razor blades. With the visual kind of tools, you can see, okay, this red area, I'm getting some bad peaks, da-da-da-da-da. Oh, I can see right where Mary finished saying what she was saying here, so it's easy for me to edit there. Put in a chapter mark because she's talking about a new part of the family, and it makes it so much easier for searchability. So one thing that is important is whatever you have on your front end, micro cassettes are harder to do because there's not a lot of equipment out there, and they can be in so many different speeds. In fact, she talks in her letter a little bit later about having some that aren't at a normal speed. Now, that's when Pro Tools really comes in to be a big benefit for you because then it'll let you go in and play with it. Yeah, absolutely. I have an old tape from the 1950s of our family, and my sister's in there. And I know her voice because she's still with us, and it still sounds very much the same. And when I could get her to sound right, then I knew that all the others who I wasn't as familiar with, that they must be correct as well. And you can, with these tools, actually pitch it up or pitch it down. And you don't do it by speeding it up like an old tape. You know, you can do it with this great tool, and it's the way it goes now, and it's fantastic. Oh, that's absolutely true. It's like going to college. You learn these little things. You get excited about them. You want to teach people. And the more you're teaching people, the more you're learning. And there's nothing funner than going in with one of your elderly neighbors and saying, hey, you know, let me help you do your stuff. Right. Like you say, when somebody dies, it's like a library burned to the ground. So you can help these people preserve part of their library. So if you have a question for Tom, you can write him anytime at asktom at tmcplace.com. Make sure you mention where you're from. And if you've got uh, specific equipment you're talking about, it would be helpful to send in uh, photographs of what that looks like so that uh, Tom can better deal with that. One thing you want to be careful with is whatever machine you're starting with, make sure it's good quality stuff. Don't go to a Goodwill and get an old piece and just assume it's going to be good. You want to go over it. You can Google all kinds of repair tips and a lot of things you can do yourself. Just be really careful with what you do. Because if you get an old machine or one that's been sitting around, it could have all kinds of gunk on the heads that have basically grown into mold that you don't even know that's in there. And then you spread it everywhere else. Exactly. You run your tapes through, you ruin your tapes, especially with the big reel-to-reel tapes. You start having flaking. That's another really good thing about her email and audio. When you're doing reel-to-reel, if you have your own machine or you found a machine, if you start running that and you see it start flaking, stop immediately. We've talked about shake and bake it. We can make it so we can transfer it. But don't run it and think, oh, I'm going to record it right now. I'm going to record it right now. Stop immediately. Get your tape baked so then you can transfer it properly. All right. Great material. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, Mary Lee, for the email. And we'll talk to you again next week, sir. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. And this segment of our show has been brought to you by FamilySearch.org. That is a wrap for this week. Thanks once again to Judy Russell, the legal genealogist, for coming onto the show and talking about divorce in the 19th century. Talk about a complicated thing, but it does leave some records of some very interesting things. Hey, and don't forget to sign up for the Weekly Genie, our weekly newsletter. Do it at ExtremeGenes.com this week. Talk to you next week. Remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Thank you.